Okay, so I want to prove the Lagrange multiplier theorem. I converted it back to the two-variable version, and I, I'm going to prove that. Um, the idea of the proof is the same. So we have a function, a C1 function. We have a point where this condition holds. The gradient of f plus lambda g is 0, where g is also C1, and that's the constraint. And we have a, a, a technical assumption here that's not... It's not only technical, it, I, I, I don't think we mentioned it when we discussed the, the geometric meaning. In the ge remember the geometric drawing that we had where the two gradients were parallel? Well, if the gradient of g is zero, that argument is not going to work either. Okay? And, and it's going to play a role in this proof as well. Okay? So we want to prove this. Okay, so here's the idea of the proof. Proof. So by assumption, um, uh, the gradient of g is not zero. That means that either, either the derivative of g with respect to x is not zero, or the derivative of g with respect to y is not zero. They can't both be zero, because then the gradient would be zero. Okay? So without loss of generality, remember this uh, expression? Without loss of generality, meaning I, I'm going to assume 1 is not 0, and the same proof is going to be with a slight modification if the other one is in 0. So without loss of generality, assume that the derivative of g with respect to y is not 0. Okay? And it's, of course, at, at the point we're looking at. It's not everywhere. It's at the point we're interested in. Okay. Now, what we have here is a function, g, whose derivative with respect to y is not 0. The function is, is c1. And the point x0, y0 solves g equals 0. It's a point on the constraint. That's the whole point of the theorem. So this holds... Uh, also, g of x0, y0 equals 0. That's what it means for the point to be a maximum on the constraint, subject to the constraint. And g is in c1. All of this is true by assumptions. Do you agree? So do you agree that these three conditions are precisely what I need for the implicit function theorem to hold for g? Those were the three conditions for the implicit function theorem. So by the implicit, oops, one extra one, implicit function theorem, whose conditions hold, whose conditions hold, there is uh, a function y equals um, y equals let's write it y of x I don't want to use f because f is our target function in this uh, in this theorem that we're proving there is a function y equals y of x that uh, satisfies g of x y equals 0 so let's write such that g of x, y of x, equals 0. Near x0, zero, y0. Zero. Right? That's what it means that we have an implicit function such that if you replace y with y of x, it satisfies the relation. Right? This is precisely the implicit function theorem. And we even know how to find the derivative of y. Right? And furthermore, we're going to use that. Furthermore, Um, y prime of x, the derivative of y with respect to x, is what? Is the derivative, is minus um, the derivative of g with respect to x divided by the derivative of g with respect to y, which we're assuming is not zero. So these are the conclusions of the implicit function theorem. Do you agree? Everybody? Okay. Now... Note that what's still missing of the, from the picture is f. Everything we said here is just about g, the constraint. Okay? So let's resort back to f. 
um, at x0, y0, f, f of x, y, has a local uh, extremum, extremum. But remember, we just saw that y can be written as a function of x. So, so what I can say is that f of x, y of x, has a max, a local max, a local extremum, max or min. Do you agree? OK. And since it has a local extremum at this point, its derivative with respect to its only variable x has to be 0. So I'm going to get a system of two equations. How am I going to write the derivative of f with respect to the variable x? What am I going to use? Chain rule, precisely. So the derivative of f with respect to x times the inner derivative, which is what? One. One. Plus the derivative of f with respect to a second variable times the inner derivative, which is what? Y prime, whatever that is. This has to be equal to zero. By the chain rule, the derivative of this has to be equal to 0 at the point x0, y0. Everything is at the point x0, y0. Okay, at x0, y0. Do you agree? And I'm going to rewrite the equation that we had before using the implicit function theorem. We know what the derivative of y is. It's minus g with respect to x divided by g with respect to y. Clear? Everybody? So what I'm going to do now is plug this, which is this, into here. So I get fx plus fy times minus gx over gy. So I'm going to change this to a minus. Minus fy gx over gy equals 0 at the point x0, y0. Do you agree? Now, so this is at x0, y0. Everything I say only holds at that point. OK. Now, these are all numbers. These are partial derivatives of functions evaluated at a specific point. They're numbers. This is a number, this is a number, this is a number, this is a number, and this relation between them gives zero. Do you agree? Okay. I'm going to denote, I'm going to denote, um, I want to stay on this board so you can see everything, so let's write it here, at x0, y0. And Now I have more space. Denote the ratio fy divided by gy. Let's denote this ratio by, this is some number. I'm going to call this number minus lambda. What is lambda? Lambda is minus this thing. Clear? So now what do I get from this, from this, by calling it this, I get that if I multiply by gy, I get fy equals minus lambda gy, or fy plus lambda gy equals zero. fy plus lambda gy equals zero. At the point, everything is at x0, y0. Clear? Now, taking this and plugging it into here, I get fx minus fy over gy was minus lambda. So from here, I get fx plus, G, plus lambda gx equals 0 as well. fx plus lambda gx equals 0 as well. This followed from here.
Do you agree? And that's it. That's what I wanted to prove. This lambda that I defined here precisely satisfied that at the point x0, y0, the gradient of f plus lambda g is 0. The gradient of f plus lambda g equals at the point, yuck, at the point x0, y0 equals 0. And this is what we wanted to prove. Clear? So when you see a proof like this, it's abstract in nature. Okay. So what you have to do is, first of all, follow from line to line. It, it only took like, I don't know what, f 10 lines. Okay, it's not a long proof, and I have big handwriting, so I'm considering this a line. Okay, so it's not a difficult proof, but there are ideas behind it, and you have to make sure you understand how we moved from one line to the other. Okay, and then there's a more, there's a more deep sort of thing you have to do, and try to think how does this reflect the intuition that we discussed previously of the gradients being parallel, how do we see it in this? Okay, and that, that takes sitting with both and thinking and trying to figure out why, why everything, how they're related. It seems like that intuition is completely unrelated to what we just wrote here, right, at first glance. Okay, okay. what I want to do next is, so, so this, this, this wraps up this proof. What I want to do next is generalize the Lagrange multiplier uh, theorem even more, not to three variables, but to more than one constraint. Okay, so we're going to have, for example, two constraints. I can ask for the maximum of a function subject to being on this trail and simultaneously being on this hill. So I have to find the intersection of the trail and the hill, and there may be several intersections, and maximize f on those constraints. Okay, so that's what we're going to do next.